right. Um, the reading today is Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 to chapter 6, verse 12. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by the time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again, subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessings of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realised. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Thanks, Greg. All right, good morning. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew. I'm one of the ministers here at All Saints. Welcome to our 10 o'clock service. Good to have you here with us. Uh, so we are now in week four of our Hebrews series, and I hope you've been really been able to digest God's word over the past couple of weeks. You know, there's some very deep theology here in Hebrews, and if we don't listen carefully, we can miss out on so much. The theme of this book, very clear. Jesus is greater, greater than the angels, greater than the Old Testament prophets, greater than the Jewish high priest, greater than everything. The writer continually points us to the supremacy of Jesus Christ, but he also continually warns us about the danger of drifting or falling away from him. Last week, we were in Hebrews 3 and 4. The writer of Hebrews used the example of Moses and the Israelites and how they fell short of receiving God's rest because of their hardness of heart. They didn't persevere to the end. And Mike exhorted us to not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, to encourage one another daily, and to persevere in the faith, to press on, right? And in the next section, chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, the author introduces this new theme of Jesus being the great high priest. And he describes the priesthood of Jesus as being greater than the Jewish high priest. He describes how Jesus is the great high priest in heaven who can fully empathize with our weakness, who was tempted just as we were, yet he did not sin. And because of his priesthood, we're able to approach God's throne of grace with confidence to receive mercy and grace in our time of need. And we'll hear more about Jesus' priesthood later in the series. In our passage today, though, the author switches gears from talking about priesthood to give another warning. Today, I'd like to unpack this package in its passage in its original context in hopes that it will help you to understand what's being said and to see how it applies to us as the church today. I'd like to ask three questions during this sermon. 
Are you actively growing in Christ? Is your faith in Christ alone? And what is the condition of your heart? Why don't we pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather here today as the communion of saints here in Balgala. Lord, we thank you for each other, and we thank you that we can sit under your word today. Lord, teach us, we pray. May your Holy Spirit guide and build us up in Christ so that we can be the church that you want us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you could please have your Bibles open in Hebrews 5.11 as we unpack today's packet, passage. I keep saying package. <laughs> unpack the package. Yes, the passage. Yes. All right, verse 11. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. So the writer starts this passage by basically saying, you know, there's more things I'd like to teach you about Jesus' priesthood, but I don't think you're ready for it yet. And they're not ready because they no longer try to understand. Another translation says, it's because you have become dull of hearing. The Greek word used here is nothros, and it means sluggish or lazy. He's saying you become lazy in your hearing. You become slow to learn. It's important to know that the same word nothros is used again to close this passage in chapter 6, verse 12. We do not want you to become nothros. We don't want you to become lazy. The author bookends the passage with this word nothros in order that we read it in this context that his original audience was being purposefully lazy in their hearing of God's Word. He wasn't pointing out a problem with their ears. He was pointing out a problem with their hearts. Their laziness to listen has left them spiritually immature, so immature that the author likens them to infants who can only drink milk and are not yet mature enough to take solid food. Continuing on, verse 12. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the element, elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk still being an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So you see, these believers should be able to share the good news of Jesus with others by now. They should be able to teach others about Jesus. But instead... In their current condition, they're more like infants, still dependent on milk. They need someone to feed them because they're unable to go beyond basic nourishment. Now, I used to have a young guitar student called Aaron, a little Dutch kid. He was around eight years old, and he loved playing the classic song by the Trogs, Wild Thing. Okay, it's an easy three-chord song. It's pretty satisfying to play when you're starting off on the guitar. You know, down, down. Dun, 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 feels powerful when you learn how to play that. And when he learned the song, he couldn't get enough of it. You know, he loved it so much that even while I started to show him new chords and new songs, he'd ignore the new stuff. He'd just keep going back to playing Wild Thing over and over and over again. And it was very frustrating for me as his teacher and his parents as well, because I gave him loads of stuff to learn, lots but he just refused to pay attention to anything else. And he was just fixated on the same three chords of Wild Thing. Now, I believe the writer of Hebrews is sharing a similar kind of frustration. You know, how the people were happy to live on milk like an infant when they should have, in fact, matured to eating solids. Verse 14, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. He's saying mature Christians, though they're through their constant study of the scriptures, can train themselves in spiritual discernment. Now, has anyone here ever done any weight training? Some people? Yes, that's good. Well, it's common knowledge, okay, that if you want your muscles to grow, you want to get stronger, you need to train. You need to train constantly. And anyone serious about weightlifting knows that you need to gradually increase the weight that you lift. You need to vary the intensity. You need to vary the different exercises you do to make progress. What was happening with these believers was like they joined the gym. They started training on five kilo dumbbells. They trained regularly, very happily doing that. But as time went on, started to train less, and they never lifted anything heavier than five kilos. Do you think they would see any progress with that kind of training? No. And that's how these young believers were treating their spiritual lives. They needed to grow up spiritually. 
but they were unwilling to do so. Their spiritual laziness has left them unable to teach others about Jesus and not even able to discern good from evil, and that's a pretty bad thing. And when we as a church today read a passage like this, we should take serious consideration to whether this could be happening in our own lives as well. Have you been lazy in your hearing of God's word lately? Do you spend time in the scriptures to train yourself to mature in the faith, really desiring to dig into the meat of God's word just for yourself to grow in Christ? Or are you content to be bottle fed like an infant? Are you confident and growing in your ability to teach others about Jesus? What's your spiritual discernment like these days? Ask yourself, are you actively growing in Christ? Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ, be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of the hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. So what are these elementary teachings of Christ that he's talking about here? Well, some theologians say the author is referring to Old Testament teachings, you know, seeing that the author often contrasts the Old Testament with the New Testament teachings about Jesus. Others say the author is talking about the basics or maybe like the ABCs of the Christian faith. And both sides have strong arguments. I personally lean towards the opinion that the elementary teachings here are talking about the Jewish teachings because simply of how the writer consistently uses Old Testament examples to point towards their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. He does this throughout the book of Hebrews. In verse 1, the writer talks about repentance from acts that lead to death to faith in God. Another translation says repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So to move from dead works towards faith in God, and these dead works could refer to the countless rituals that the Jewish priests would perform. He then talks about cleansing rites and laying of hands. Some say he's talking about Christian baptism here, but the Greek word used for cleansing is baptismo, which is only used in the New Testament in reference to Jewish ceremonial washings, not Christian baptism. The laying of hands could refer to how the high priest would lay his hands on the sacrificial animals as part of a specific offering to God. And finally, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment also doctrines held by the Jewish faith, but the outcome was based on human works, dead works, and not the saving grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I hope you see what the writer is saying to his audience here. Stop relying on these teachings, the Jewish teachings, which are only a shadow and a picture of the things to come. You're so fixated on the old rituals, you can't even see the Christ that they're pointing to. Let's mature from those things. Leave those things behind and fully grasp onto the real salvation that comes through complete faith in Jesus. And God permitting, Lord willing, we will do this. You see, these early believers were so fixated on their own religious deeds to save themselves and losing sight of the sufficiency of Jesus to save. And friends, if we're not careful, we can also do this. It's very possible for a person to do a bunch of religious things and become so reliant on doing good stuff for God that we lose sight of what Jesus has already done for us. How Jesus came to earth, fully God and fully human. How he lived the perfect life without sin, yet he willingly gave up his life on that cross to die for our sins so that we could be forgiven. And that he rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death so that whoever repents and believes in him can have eternal life. Putting our complete faith in the person and work of Jesus is the only thing that can save us. And if we think that anything that we do can somehow put us in right or better standing with God, then we, like the people in Hebrews, are in terrible danger of falling away and missing the point altogether. Are you inwardly relying on your own religiosity to save you? Or do you truly, fully rely and trust in what Jesus has already done. Ask yourself, is your faith in Christ alone? Verse 4, it's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, 
who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Now, this section of Scripture is often considered quite controversial because it appears to call into question the assurance of someone's salvation. In one commentary, I read that this passage is known as one of the devil's favorite passages. And why? Because when taken out of context, it can condemn a struggling Christian. Some preachers have used this section to cast fear and doubt into believers, to manipulate or control them, preaching something like, keep doing the right things or you might lose your salvation. This approach emphasizes salvation by works instead of salvation by grace through faith. Others take in the opposite stance, teaching once a person makes a decision to follow Christ, then nothing else matters. What's often called once saved, always saved. This view, however, fails to consider the evidence of a truly transformed and converted heart. And friends, both of these extremes are dangerous and unbiblical views of salvation. Let's examine the passage more closely. So the description here, someone who's been enlightened, someone who's tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit and tasted the goodness of God's word. This could certainly describe a genuine Christian, right? But it can also describe anyone whose mind has been enlightened by the gospel, who has felt the Holy Spirit's presence and has even been moved by God's word. But these individuals, though they've had a taste of God's goodness, for whatever reason, they still aren't willing to fully accept salvation in Christ. Let's consider the context of this letter. The author is addressing a group of new believers, some of whom were going back to Judaism. Many were spiritually immature, still holding on to old traditions rather than moving beyond the basics of Christ's teachings to fully embrace salvation in him. Not everyone in this community was showing the perseverance that genuine faith produces. And the author warns us that for those who have heard and experienced much of God's goodness, yet continue to trust in old rituals instead of Christ, it becomes impossible to restore them to repentance. Their reliance on old rituals, in a sense, are like a continual crucifixion of Christ as they keep trusting the old rituals rather than trusting in Jesus Christ. The warning here isn't about genuine believers backsliding to the point where they lose their salvation. The warning in this passage is about someone who experiences and tastes the goodness of God, but still refuses to fully trust in Jesus. It's a denial of Christ, which makes it impossible to restore someone to repentance. And like how Jesus explains about the different types of ground in the parable of the sower, the author of Hebrews explains here, verse 7, Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it's farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. You see, the word of God, it's received differently by each person. And depending on the condition of their hearts, it will either produce a useful crop or it will produce worthless thorns. What's the condition of your heart? Is it like the good soil that will produce a useful crop? Or is it filled with thorns, unable to produce anything useful? You see, a true believer bears the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, and Jesus says in John 10 that nothing can snatch the true believer out of his hand. Nothing. But a false convert doesn't produce anything. Nothing but thorns destined to be burned. And it's impossible to bring such a person back to repentance. It's a very, very harsh warning that we need to hear. And the writer finishes with some encouragement. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. So he's saying now that even though I've been very harsh with you, I don't think you're past the point of repentance. I'm actually convinced that you're on the path to true salvation. He then reminds his readers that God sees the love that they've shown him, and he also sees their continual help towards other believers. He urges them then to stay diligent to the word to the very end, to press on, 
And he exhorts them by saying, don't become lazy, but imitate the faith of those who have persevered to the end. Those heroes of the faith who we'll hear about later on in Hebrews as well. So in closing, let's not be content with a shallow relationship with Jesus. Let's continually press on to know him more and more deeply through our reading of the word, through prayer. Let's listen to his word, not lazily, but diligently. Let's cling on to the salvation that comes by grace through faith in Christ alone. Let's pay attention to the warning, but also pay attention to the encouragement to press on and persevere in Christ, to trust him, to trust that as we abide in Jesus, he will strengthen us to bear the fruit of true repentance. Let's be people who bear lasting fruit, not out of duty or obligation, but out of love and trust in Jesus, in whom we find assurance of salvation and hope for eternity. Amen.